Hello and welcome to Awaken Empower TV. I'm your host, Ethan Fox. Today I'm joined by Keith Scott of the Office of International Treasury Control. If you're unfamiliar with the OITC, you'll have an opportunity to learn more about it from Keith himself and also learn more about him, the purpose of the OITC, and what is really happening behind the scenes in the financial climate of the world. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Keith Scott. Thank you, Keith, for joining me for Awaken and Empower TV today. It's a pleasure for me to have you on the show, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about the financial world and uh, your experience in that area. But first, I'd really love to hear more about you, your background, uh, maybe even you know how you came across uh, the experience in your education, maybe even, and uh, anything that you think would give us a little bit of understanding and uh, foundation for the topics we're going to be discussing later. Yeah. Good morning, Ethan. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to join you today and uh, to explain some of the things from uh, our background and what uh, the work that I've worked in for now for almost 30 years. I grew up as a, a rather simple country boy, a little town, a little place called Barongarook West, just south of Colac in Victoria. And uh, I was one of a family of 10. Uh, my family were farmers, and in fact, most of my brothers today are still farmers. And um, I was never meant to be a farmer, and I moved on into other areas. Um, I spent quite a few years working in an organisation, um, which we won't discuss, but through that period, uh, I was put through a, a number of very intensive training areas, and I learned about many different things uh, related to banking, to, to uh, finance, and, and to certain global issues and I when I first started on this I didn't understand quite where this was taking me or what the purpose was. Eventually in uh, 1989 I met up with a gentleman in the United States called Michael McKnight and Michael uh, brought me into a company called Mid-America Development and Management Corporation and uh, they were involved in some rather peculiar things. Um, one of those things was moving money, and I, I learned a lot from them on how to process unusual transactions, why these, why these were being done. There was nothing sinister in what they were doing. They did these transactions for a number of governments around the world. And then from there, I was sent to... Cambodia. Again, I was not told why I needed to go to Cambodia. I was just told you go to Cambodia. Um, when you get there, you'll meet this particular man and you just wait there and the right people will eventually contact you, which is what, exactly what happened. And then through this, I met with His Excellency Dr. Ray C. Dan, who had been appointed back in 1980. Eight, as the International Treasury Controller. And at that time, what was operating was the Tripartite um, uh, Gold Commission, which operated in The Hague. Uh, he was a, had been a commissioner on, that, uh, on the commission. And later, the commission was wound up in 1994, um, having served its full 50-year term from 1944 until 1944. Uh, sorry, 1944 till 1994. And then he was appointed as the sole arbitrator on the global accounts. I met him in, it would have been in February in... 1997, after I had arrived in Cambodia. At first, I was very reluctant to believe what the people were telling me about him because it just didn't seem 
logical that you'd find such a man in Cambodia, but that's where he was, um, primarily because he was a Cambodian. He loved his own country and he didn't see why he needed to work in New York or in Geneva when he could do the same job in Cambodia. So uh, over a period of time, we got to know each other. Our first meeting was very strange. Um, he asked me some questions, what I would do in certain circumstances, and I responded to that. And then he came a question and he said, then what would you do with the money? I said, you need it tracked or do you need to move the money without it being tracked? And he said, without being tracked. So I said to him, okay, um, this is what we would do. And I explained to him about a situation where we would move money from Philadelphia to, to uh, Bahamas and what the process was in the Bahamas and then how the money moved from there without any trace on it. He then asked me the name of the company and I told him the name of the company and he said, well, what do you know about this company? And I told him that this company is controlled by a particular group of trustees and I named who the trustees were. And at this time I noticed there's a bit of a glint in his eye and he's looking at me very intently and he said to me, okay, well, who controls th those particular trustees? And I said, well, uh, they're controlled by the New World Trustees. And he said, what do you know about the New World Trustees? I said, well, it's interesting because nobody seems to know anything about who the New World Trustees are. And he said, um, hmm. He said, besides you, there's, a, there's a little box sitting on the table, a very highly polished little rosewood box. He said, open that box. So I, I opened the box. He said, take out one of the cards, take out a card, read it to me. And on a Dr. Racing Chairman, the New World Trustees. So at that particular point, that was my introduction to Dr. Dan. We discussed things for over a number of days. And um, he asked me to check some accounts. I went to back to my old friend Michael McKnight, and he went into the Chicago Fed and I'd given him the codes so that he could open the screens and check certain accounts. So he went in, he opened the screens and he came back. He called me at, it was 2.30 in the morning when he called me and he said to me, this world is full of flakes. But your dear Dr. Dam is not one of them. When I opened that screen, he said he would not even know 1% of the accounts in his name controlled by him. He wouldn't know 1%. He couldn't. He said they're in the tens of thousands. And let me tell you, he said, when it comes to gold, the only name that matters in this world is Dr. Ray C. Dam. That's the only name that matters. That for me was a, a complete confirmation of exactly why I was sent to Cambodia. Dr. Dam at that point then asked me to join with him, which I did. I, he asked me to work for him actually, and I said, no. I said, I will work with you, but I will never work for you. And he understood that. Um, over the years, uh, Dr. Dam and I, we've had some fights, uh, some arguments, and uh, but they've never been personal. Nothing, nothing personal in it at all. We're disagreements, but over a period of time, we come to trust each other, and and we also came to understand that um, the arguments were about issues and that the issues were important and they needed to be discussed and we needed to, to, to understand various aspects of these, these uh, issues. And so the best way to do that is, I suppose, it wasn't an argument, but certainly to discuss them quite robustly. And, um, 
and we did we did this many many times. Uh, I was eventually in 2003. We changed the name of the office. I'd met with some three-letter agency people in in the U.S. And after a long discussion with them, it was decided that we needed to change the name from the office of His Excellency Ray C. Dam, uh, Dr. Ray C. Dam, to the um, Office of International Treasury Control. And under the sovereign uh, entitlements and rights of Dr. Dam, we could set that up totally under our own control. We didn't have to go to another government. We didn't have to go to anyone to do that. And so that is exactly what was done. Um, the office actually operated, was supposed to operate secretly. It was something that most people are not supposed to know. There is a problem with that. And that problem is that what we could see is that the world banking system, the, the commercial banking system, and the central banking system, is very destructive and disruptive to countries. And it's very manipulative. And it's manipulated by a few nations and, it, and, and against, in many cases, the better interests of other nations. And we found that to be repulsive. In all the time I worked at OITC, we were never allowed to draw our salary. We had to make our own money, which we did from trading. And we would trade in literally anything from rice or you could trade in sometimes in wheat, sometimes in scrap iron, whatever we could, we could get, wherever we could get a deal and make enough money to keep the office running and, and, uh, and to survive. And that we did. The reason we never took our money was because the money was to be paid to us through the financial constraints department in the United Nations. And those, uh, when I discussed, I, I didn't know about this at first. It wasn't until I met the agency people in the United States who actually told me about this, that these funds were there. And why weren't we using them? And so I asked Dr. Dam and he just simply said to me, if you take the devil's money, you are bound to do the devil's bidding. And we're not going down that road. I'm, I was put here to be an independent arbiter, and that's what I will be. I will not be controlled by anybody. Um, and I, over the years that I worked with Dr. Dam, the one thing I can honestly say about him is that he was incorruptible, totally utterly incorruptible. One of the hardest men that I've ever met, uh, hard like Flint. He was, uh, he had an amazing view of his own persona, his own behaviour, as how he should behave, and he behaved according to that view. A lot of people may not have liked it, a lot of people may have found him arrogant, some may have even thought he was ignorant. It's just that he knew and understood different realities. Working with him, I suppose, in many ways, uh, a lot of his attributes, uh, at least I hope they did, uh, tended to rub off on myself. And uh, I've kept pretty much to, to those things. Unfortunately, uh, there were people within the organisation and people without the organisation who wanted to see that destroyed. Um, and that happened in 2010. Uh, a series of things were orchestrated by a, one of the people inside our ITC. And he set about to destroy Dr. Dam um, and also myself. Dr. Dam was uh, in jail for around six months in, in Cambodia. He was later released. He went to Thailand and he's there under the protection of the king. And the, uh, today he's, he is uh, quite an amazing, for me, he's, he's still just an amazing human being. The work that we did was not to use the accounts and never to take anything for our own benefit and we never ever did. Um, our job was to make sure that 
any usage of the accounts was within the framework that it should have been. And it wasn't until we got the, the various Basel agreements that uh, things really started to come under control. But prior to that, what we were required to do was to report um, issues that we felt were wrong and what when we found people doing things that were wrong, um, our job was to report that to the US Senate Committee on Banking, Urban Housing, and uh, so Banking, Finance, and uh, Urban Housing. And that was what we did. And in each case that that actually occurred, the people who were involved were removed from their office uh, and, in actual fact, lost their bankers' licenses. So that's where, um, uh, that's really the background to OITC. It, it was a regulatory organisation. It was not a trading organisation. It wasn't involved in money markets or anything like that. We were never involved in those things, not ever. Um, and Dr. Dam, uh, I can honestly say I'm proud to have worked with him uh, for, for the number of years that I did. I can also say it was a tough life. It was never easy. Um, it was a very difficult life in many ways, but uh, it was well worth it. And I felt that the work that we did and what we were doing in the world was was uh, a benefit. Um, I often get attacked over what happened in Fiji in 2006, where we decided that uh, for a number of reasons, to strip a Freddie Mac note and to give them the, the money to the Fijians. The, when we worked it all out, it was mainly for reforestation, which would have actually generated a tremendous amount of, of growth within Fiji, would have been tremendously beneficial to them. And there were a number of other things. They needed homes for the age they needed, and that was especially requested of us by the chairman of the Senate at that time, uh, Mr. Taito uh, Wakabakatoga, and um, we we acceded to that. We, we agreed, and we cut a strip note for $3 billion. Now, that was drawn on Merrill Lynch. It's the only time Merrill Lynch ever transferred an asset to Fiserv Industries, which they did. And they took $3 billion that was on that strip note that we think, and they transferred that to Fiserv, uh, Fiserv Industries, um, which is part of Fidelity. And, and they did that to block us from being able to draw. Now, it wouldn't have stopped it because the money, the cash would have been there to do it anyway, and, and Merrill Lynch would have had to have delivered the cash if the government called it. And all we required. Now, after... After uh, Fiji, the police commissioner was compelled to leave and he'd be arrested if he went back there today. Even though he works for the United Nations, he would be back there. Uh, if he went back to Fiji, he would be arrested. The finance minister went through some very, very difficult times and the prime minister, who was the primary person who blocked the, the Fijians being able to call that note, he was arrested for corruption. And what we found out later is that he owned a number of oil blocks and what would have happened had the, the chiefs and the clans been able to get the money to assert their land rights, that he would have lost those, those leases. And that's why they blocked the, the money. I shouldn't say that. I should say we believe that that's why they blocked the, uh, that money from coming into Fiji. So can you give me a little bit of... Um just a general, uh, we spoke a little about the specifics about some of the things the um, Office of International Treasury Control has done, like the, what you were just sharing. But what really is the purpose of the office, uh, if you can sum that up in simple terms? And, and why is it that, that it's, um, uh, stay, it's, it's known in the mainstream media as a fraudulent organization and really the United Nations and Federal Reserve and these established um, mainstream uh, organizations disavow any connection with the OITC? Well, they don't have any actual connection uh, other, than, other than the fact in, in the background. The purpose of the OITC, you have to go back to the back, uh, background of the BIS. 
If we take the BIS, why was the BIS actually set up? Why do we need this central bank for central banks? And the answer to that is this. If we go back to 1921, Emperor Hirohito went to London in 1921 and he called a conference of global leaders, of world leaders. In that conference, they understood, this is just after the Versailles Treaty, by the way. In that conference, they understood the actual problem that had occurred with the First World War. Now, the First World War had been fought, it had been won by one side, lost by another, and had changed absolutely nothing, not a thing. And they understood from that that another war was inevitable. And, and they decided at that time to plan the changing of currency. They understood the gold standard was a, a major problem. Um, and if left the gold standard eventually, because gold in, in, in those days, wherever the gold was, and, and a lot of it was privately owned, it was either owned by Chinese or it was owned by Jews. And the gold was the background of all money. The problem was that governments couldn't control their own economies. And so the gold, this gold had to be rounded up and it had to be secreted. So what they did is they made their plans right through from 1921 right up to the Gold Act in 1933 the establishment of the, of the um, Foreign Gold Act in the United States, which was an act that was then eventually became um, a law all around the world. But private gold could not be held by anybody. Nobody could own these vast amounts of private gold. So during the war, uh, we, we, leading up to the Second World War, we had this period where these plans were worked out, calculated out, and they were based going back to the Jekyll Island plans of, of 2000 and, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, uh, 1908. And then there came the Aldwych plan. Um, and then we created the Federal Reserve in 1915. Then we, we moved on and we had this conference in 1921 when world leaders met and made certain agreements. These agreements are all secret. Because who wants to be who wants to be known as a a person that organised or constructed a war in which sixty million people lost their lives? But the alternative was, uh, as they understood at that time, that the world was had grown to a point where the power of destruction was so great that mankind could literally eliminate himself. And that had to be stopped. And that couldn't be stopped with the economic structures that we had at that time. Not only could it not be stopped, but they would eventually create that destruction. He... In, uh, Hirohito is actually the one, probably the main architect, and this is why they call him the Great Showa or the the Emperor of Peace. The idea was to create a, a great peace and to collect and gather all this wealth that was independently controlled and bring it into a central system, and then all countries to have equitable access to that. Now, originally the that's, that is through the Second World War what they did, and that's why we had, you had the Holocaust, you have uh, the Jews, because the tragedy of this was not only could the, not only did the gold have to be rounded up, but the people that owned it had to be eliminated. And then you go on into such things as uh, the, the uh, sing uh, Chuxing massacres where the Japanese massacred some 30 million people 
mostly Chinese, throughout Asia during the, the uh, Second World War. And these are terrible things, but the gold was all rounded up. And it was sh shipped by the Japanese and by the Germans. There was a lot of gold out of Europe was taken out and it was moved by the Germans to central repositories. And in actual fact, it was reposited back into the Bank for International Settlements. And so as this gold was collected and gathered, it became accessible to all national treasuries. And so each treasury has its own rights to draw from that. In the current climate today, what we do is we have our birth certificate, which is we, we, we register when, we, when we're born. And then that goes through to the treasury. The treasury then issues a bond. To underwrite that bond is this global wealth. That's what actually puts the value behind the bond. Because without that, if you didn't have this global system, you, you couldn't, the, then the, 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 the birth bonds don't matter too much. But this is because everybody was to have equitable, and I mean equitable access. That's your birthright. Now, the interesting thing about the, the birth bond is, of course, that's owned by the person who, in whose name it is issued. Before I digress, go into that, let's go back to uh, the creation of the global accounts, which is what this centralised gold basically is. Now, you add to that all these birth certificates that come in from around the world, and, and now you have a completely collateralised system which forms the underpinning of global wealth. Did we, um, before we get too far into this, did we actually address the OITC and its, um, as my, my question was, um, what was the OITC? Was the, role, right. the role of the OITC was basically replacing the Tripartite Gold Commission because there has to be an independent body who oversees what happens with this gold. You can't just simply leave it to government because... Uh, if you put the, the, that power under, let's say, the United States, well, if you please the United States, you can access it. And if you don't please the United States, you have no rights to it. And if you please Russia or if you please England or you don't please them, you have no right to it. There has to be an independent system which has no political, uh, no political um, influence that controls who can and who can't utilise or access or use that wealth. Now, in 1934, the US dollar uh, and the British pound were the two main global currencies, and in 1963, the US dollar gained the supremacy eventually in 1968 and became the world uh, reserve currency. And so the, all this wealth that's in the BIS is locked into what is known as the institutional parent registration accounts that are held under the Federal Reserve. In those accounts is all this global wealth. It's all basically held in, in, in that centralised system. And it's held under the institutional parent registration accounts. The signatory to the registration accounts is Dr. Dan. He is, he is the, the person who technically has the power to sign or not to sign on those accounts. And so, therefore, when certain things, somebody wants to do something, uh, he as an independent arbitrator he can decide yes or no. And he, and he decides purely based on the merits of whatever argument is put to him. So that was that was our main role. And then, but what we also found was happening that banks were actually using a lot of this wealth illegally. They were creating fraudulent gold certificates. They were issuing them out. There were derivatives being cut off them. Um, um, uh, one particular operation in Jama in uh, in the Bahamas. Um, were shut down because of this, because they got caught, not because of what they were doing, but because they got caught doing what they were doing. And so we, we moved to shut that down. Um, 
and we did so quite successfully. So, yeah, look, over a period of time, um, we were not somebody who interacted with the general public. We very rarely interacted with commercial bankers or had anything to do with them unless we caught them doing something wrong. And then that would have been reported to the uh, US uh, Senate Committee and then they deal with it. And in the uh, and through all this, we were ideally supposed to stay in the background. The problem with that is then we created, we found another problem which we found unconscionable. And that problem is that people have no idea how banking actually works and, and how money works. They have no idea. None. And yet they're supposed to interact and operate within that world without knowing what the bankers know. And most of the fraud that goes on in banking goes on because the banker knows, but the ordinary person has, has no clue. They just don't know. None of this is taught in, in any school anywhere in the world. No university teaches these things. As to, and, and so we've ended up with a money system which is totally skewed to create profits for the banks. And if you look at the profits the banks make today, they are enormous. Absolutely. And, and they're, they're, they're worse than enormous. They're unconscionable. Now, the bank will say, well, uh, you know, that profit is only uh, 4% or 5% of our capital. The truth is that when you talk about shares of a company like a bank, it's a dog chasing its own tail. What I mean by that is the share price value of the bank goes up with the profit level of the bank. So the share price increases and increases. And the more profits make it, the more the share price increases. And so, and you've got the shareholders pressing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pressing the banks to generate more profit. And so the banks sit down and they figure out various ways of creating more profits. And what they're doing, in actual fact, is they're robbing you and me. They're robbing the people. But the people, because they don't know how things work, they don't know. And they don't realise they're being robbed. And so we found that to be totally unconscionable. And in 1998, I began a campaign to try and get some of this information out to people. But... What actually happened is the more you tried to do that, the more, more we were attacked. And the more we were attacked, well, we just dug our heels in and said, okay, you, if you don't want to believe it's fine, but that's how it is. The, 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 the hard part of that was that my family had to live through it. That's the hard part. And I do have a family. I have, I have children, I have grandchildren, and they have to live through these things. And then I have to weigh up, whether it's all worth it. And those things, those decisions don't come easy. But at the end of the day, you either have to stand on your feet and stand true to what you believe and what you know, or you have to walk away like a coward. And that was never an option for us. And over a period of time, um, I think there's more acceptance now that the Things like OITC do exist, that it was real. It wasn't just a scam, that, that was more to it. And as people begin to open up and they see more about the collateral accounts and, and these things, of course there has to be some control system over that. How can you just simply leave that to um, a bunch of bankers? And, and believe me, bankers are probably among the least trustworthy people in the world. So... It's, yeah, it ha has, has life been easy for us? No, it hasn't. It, it's been extremely difficult. And the price we've paid for it has been very high. But if I had to do the same things again, would I? Um, probably. 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 I, I, I think I'd have to be actually confronted with that situation. Um, before I'd, I'd want to, going through it a second time, I think would be just too much. I've had uh, 
almost you know, 17 years of it and, and and it has been very, very hard personally at, at a personal level. But um, that's life. Did we ever actually make anything out of OITC? No, that's that wasn't our function. We were there as guardians and gatekeepers. And... Um, that 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 was our function. Raiding the, the the purse was never part of it, and I can guarantee you, Doctor Dam certainly never ever did. Um, and he would never allow anybody around him to do it, never. So, what were you guarding exactly? I mean, when when you're saying you're, you were guardians, in simple terms, what were you exactly guarding? Okay, Doctor Dam is a signatory on the IPRA accounts or the the institutional parent registration accounts of the Federal Reserve System. And these are made up of gold. Um, and there's a lot more gold in the world than what we're led to believe. It's, it's uh, the amounts are infinitely greater. Um, the treasure, the wealth of, of the what's known as the collateral accounts. And we were the guardians of the system. And that was that was our function. And we did it without any um, without any protection from any state, without any any um, help, I guess, in, in, in many ways. But the fact is those things cannot be moved without his signature. And I believe that's still the same today, even though they've largely destroyed OITC as it was, and it's actually gone deeper and it's become uh, probably more more uh, difficult now for the system to actually engage in OIT, uh, or with uh, Dr. Dam. Because Dr. Dam, at the end of the day, was the only man that really mattered. I may have been chief of cabinet, um, and uh, I participated in making certain decisions and I participated in quite a lot of the activities. But the real, as they say, the, the buck really stopped with Dr. Dan. And the uh, end decision was always his, always. And his job was to make sure that these accounts were not, this money was not being abused. So let's talk That's about, um, let's go back to, what you started discussing about the uh, the bond that's issued uh, and and maybe give us a little education about how the financial system really is structured and, and how it actually works. When you go to a bank and you want to borrow money, the bank will lend you money against your promise to repay. But against your promise to repay, there has to be surety. And so when you issue a promissory note to the, to the bank, the surety is automatically taken up by the global accounts because the global accounts go through your treasury department. The treasury department interacts directly with the BIS, with the IMF, with uh, et cetera the World Bank, etc. When you go into a bank and you borrow money, the bank doesn't actually lend you money. That's one of the greatest fallacies of banking. And in actual fact, it's, it's total fraud for a bank to say that it does lend you money. A bank is not allowed to lend its clients money. That's against the law. So... What happens is you go into the bank, you take out a loan, for example, to buy a house, like a mortgage loan. So when you do that, what happens is you issue a promissory note to the bank to make your repayments. The bank is supposed to, doesn't do this now, it, it's gone into private collateralization. But what the bank is supposed to do is register that asset in the treasury, the house. So the, the, the home then belongs to the treasury. And this is underwritten, your promissory note is underwritten by your account in the global treasury. But your account in the, sorry, in the treasury, your account collects 
indirectly into the things that are held by the BIS evil accounts. So what you're effectively doing is those funds are what underwrite your promise. If you take a Freddie Mac note, for example, a Freddie Mac um, is actually underwritten by the global accounts. Now, most people don't know these things or don't understand, but the underwriting is actually surety on your promise to make those repayments. The bank is not even a party in interest or should not be a party in interest. The registration of the loan should be filed directly into the Treasury. The Treasury then levies that against the global accounts through the IMF, exactly the same as it does with your birth certificate. When it issues a bond against your birth certificate, that's registered through the IMF. It goes onto the stock exchange and they're traded on the stock exchange literally as a slave bond. So everything that you buy or you do or every time you borrow money, the underwriter is the global accounts. That's how important it is. So the actual underwriter of currency is the global accounts. Because when a country uh, issues a promise to pay to its central bank, the underwriter of that promise is the global accounts. And so everything is actually issued from there. It's not issued in the way that people think it is. And if you stop and think about that, all the gold that was privately owned at one time and owned privately by banks is now centralised into, a, into a, a central system. We take the birth certificate, the birth bond. Now, to give the birth bond value, that also has to be underwritten. Everything is underwritten by the global accounts. Everything. And so... Our work as, as, as guardians of that and, and as administrators to make sure that people didn't misuse it and, and, and that it wasn't being used in the wrong way and just simply for the banks to make profit, and, and there were a lot of banks that were doing that. Um, we, uh, it was our job to ensure that, that that didn't occur. And so the, this wealth then goes from the global accounts, goes into the institutional parent registration accounts, of the Federal Reserve, which is the global currency, which pr produces the global currency. Perception and truth are two different things. What one perceives to be truth is not necessarily so. What real truth is, is usually what people don't know. And particularly, this is the case with money. The central banking system is owned by private banks. And it's private bankers who end up running these things. I mean, you've only got to go back and look at who people who were involved in uh, running the U.S. Treasury over the last few years and who run the, the Federal Reserve. These are people out of private banks. You only have to look at what happened in... Um, uh, in Europe when Ireland um, didn't settle on its debts, as everybody expected, but basically said to the, the, the uh, IMF and to banks and everybody else said, well, you know, first, we, we're happy to pay our debts, but first, you prove to us that we actually owe you this money. And, of course, they can't. Uh, and the reason they can't is because they don't. And so the IMF then responded, well, by offering them a 60% deduction. But the finance minister was smart enough to say, no, uh, you, you show us that we, we'll, we'll pay our debts, but first you prove to us that we actually owe the money. And you prove to us that you actually loaned us the money because he understood that the money didn't come from the banks at all that it actually comes from the global accounts. And what, he, what they were drawing on is Ireland's rights within the global, it's exactly the same with Greece. So immediately after that, the, uh, Ireland did that, what did the 
European Union do? The European Union then got rid of Papandreou because he knew what the Irish knew. They got rid of, uh, and they replaced him with Pappas. Where was Pappas from? Pappas was from Goldman Sachs. They got rid of Berlusconi and they replaced him. Where was the replacement from? Goldman Sachs. And they got rid of, they, they, they did the same thing with the finance ministers in Portugal and, and Spain. And the reason why these people understood how the, the system actually operated. And in referring to this, that the one particular point, Christine Lagarde made a very interesting point. She said banks over the years have, have actually, they, they bring in lawyers and they've moved from this is banking is supposed to to go in a certain direction and what they do is they incrementally little by little move off that line until uh, they're almost diametrically opposed to it the, the and what she said was that the world probably needs to go back to where banking was in about 1954 now, i'd agree with that I think that's where we actually have to go back, where assets in a nation are properly registered within the Treasury, where the repayments on those assets goes to the Treasury instead of going into the, into the private pockets of bankers and, and their shareholders. And I think that's where we, we've got to go. Um, and I, I think that will happen in, in, in the future and probably not too distant future. I think those changes will eventually come around because they have to. So what, what is your um, timetable for that? Is, is it uh, for, for that transition to occur? Do you have any idea based on what you actually know is going on in the world? Yeah, there is. Um, I'm hoping that we can begin a, this transition that, that, that within probably the next 12 months. If we can get that going within the next 12 months, because the world is going to go into turmoil, economic turmoil. There's absolutely no doubt about that. It can't keep going because what's actually happened is you've got debt compounding on debt and debt compounding on debt, and that's growing exponentially faster as every, every, uh, every month goes by. And so what happens is that eventually the debt overtakes the capacity to repay, and at that point it's not just one country that's going to go into default. It's... it's it's there'll be a, a, a default will start somewhere, most likely in the US, and then that will reverberate right through the entire system. At that point, you need a new economic model. And I think the, the system that Benjamin Franklin had going back into, you know, back into the mid uh, 18th century was an actual fact a better model than what we actually have today. Um, and, and that may very well be what we revert to. And it can be enhanced. You can still utilise the, we, we have the collateral accounts to underwrite everything. And I think the possibility is we'll be able to eliminate interest. And I think that's probably going to happen within between, my guess would be between 19, uh, sorry, 2017 and 2025, I think we will see a complete new economic model. Okay, so describe for me what that model looks like besides, and, and how do we go from a system uh, that, that we currently have to a system with no interest? We have interest only to satisfy banks. So the, the, the banks make excessive profits. There are costs in running a bank, and a bank is actually a third-party debt collector and an escrow holder for the National Treasury, or at least that's what it should be. I think the easiest way to describe this is that all things become registered in the Treasury, all assets within a nation become registered within the Treasury and become part of the national wealth and become part of the national wealth base. And against that, you can issue currency. Uh, for example, if in the United States, if every building, every bridge, every every 
major asset within the country. Every power station, every farm, every business, every business. If those were assets that were registered in the Treasury, how solid would the United States be? It would have almost unlimited wealth. And at the same time, if people were making the repayments back into the Treasury uh, in lieu of taxes, the government would be far better off. On a particular model that I did here, we, we looked at, for example, housing. If you take a, uh, an ordinary person, just renting a working person who rents a house, uh, in Australia, for example, we have about 1.5 million families who cannot afford to buy a home. Now, that's a, a pretty egregious thing. If we could, if we got rid of the interest and we were able to provide them a house, say, 200, 250,000, uh, dollars, the repayments on that would probably be around $100 a week or a little bit over that. So if we were to repay uh, that money to the Treasury, where that family would be paying, say, around uh, and about 50%, the lower 50% uh, of income people in Australia they pay an average per family of about sixteen hundred dollars uh, in, in taxes in income tax a year. So, if we were able to, say, take the allow them to continue even paying the sixteen hundred dollars um, plus, they were able to bring their house payments back to five thousand uh, dollars a year. They would be saving in reality, around $8,000 a year, which would become expendable income. If you had every family in Australia, then on, on that same system, every home would be registered in the Treasury as an asset, as, as, as a national asset. You would have trillions of dollars available in the Treasury to fund constant trade. And all you need to do is issue money to facilitate that trade backwards and forwards. That's all you need to do. And that's not, that's not a problem because the funds would always be there to do it. But when you're creating debt, which has a, com a compounding debt a a a attached to it, what you're really doing is creating an ongoing debt cycle. If you eliminate that, and, and go the other way so that people, when they deposit the asset in the Treasury, well, there's no need to pay interest because that asset that they deposit in the Treasury is money of substance. It's like a gold bar or it's like silver or it, it's property. It, whatever it is, it is of value. When you start putting things into the Treasury that have actually no value and there's no value behind because the banks are actually taking that and they're, they're, they're drawing off the money from the working man and then they're spreading that around among their shareholders, this is only going to create debt. If you go the other way so that there's no interest component, because interest is death, it, it, it truly is, where there's no interest component, what you can then do is that these people would have an extra seven or eight thousand dollars a year to inject into society into buying more things doing more things spending money going out to dinners doing the kind of things that people would like to do and so they have that option and what that does that creates employment that creates growth it creates wealth instead of doing it the way that we're doing it which is death it, it, it what it what it does it, it stifles death stifles growth. You, you, you can't get growth because all the money is being sucked out of the economy paying interest. Um, and I believe that that's, that's the kind of model that we need to go for. Um, and, and I think that's what, what will come out of all this. This is several years down the road. I think the world's going to go through a lot of turmoil before we get to that point. 
Now, you anticipate something happening in the next few months, uh, and I've heard this from other people as well. Um, that now, let's speak specifically about the United States. Do you expect some sort of a transition in the, the banking system and um, maybe a, a new type of currency being issued in the, in the near future? Right. There, there are a couple of issues involved here. And those issues are actually seen as totally separate issues, but unfortunately they're not. One is the massive immigration problem that America is suffering at the moment. This is not, this is a manufactured problem. This is not something um, that is occurring just naturally. It's a created problem and it's meant to create turmoil. But, all, and so, but, but along with that, um, there's a huge amount of debt that has to be met in September. And that's next month. The United States doesn't have the money to settle these. So where do we go from there? Now, that, the, the, uh, and the real problem is, is because of the way the system in itself is structured. Now, that will bring, I think, an immense amount of currency controls, like we, we see now in, in, for example, a country like Venezuela. In Venezuela, the Bolivar is worth... Well, 6.3 on the official rate. Well, the government might exchange it at 12.7 under another rate, or they might exchange it at 172 on another rate, depending on what you want that money for, why you want to exchange that bolivar into a US dollar. Now, is that going to happen in the United States? Probably not, but, but it, it indicates the kind of problem that people are going to have. And in these meltdown times, um, I think you're heading to a depression that's possibly even worse than, than 1930s. Um, this is going to create immense dissatisfaction. It's going to create other problems. Now, you exacerbate that with the immigrant problem that you have and one then sits back and you you really have to wonder and and in some cases some of the immigrants are the worst kind of immigrants you could have because they have an ideology that will not tolerate any other ideology so you so you're anticipating some sort of period of crisis and you uh, but what so what comes after that so you're, you're expecting this sometime in the next year through 2017 a lot of changes but where are we really heading long term? I, I, I think there'll be changes. The, the real changes will start somewhere else. They'll start outside the United States and then eventually, as the turmoil in the United States settles down, uh, it, it, it will eventually gravitate once, once it's seen that this is a system that works and works extremely well. Um, then I think it, it, it will just gravitate exactly the same as, as, for example, the fiat currency system. It took uh, a very long time to implement fiat currencies. It wasn't something that happened immediately. I mean, they started working on this in 2000, uh, sorry, in uh, 1908 at the Jekyll Island Conference. And then you, you, you have the whole process just to get the Federal Reserve up and going. That took some uh, uh, seven years. And then to get to the next stage, from uh, starting the Federal Reserve, getting to the next stage, took almost another seven years. And then getting from that point to the plan of the experts where we started to lay out exactly how we were going to manage this global wealth, that took another seven years. And then we go from the stage from when we've got it all worked out to where we can actually implement it, that took another seven years. But it's, this seven is, is a, a very interesting number. Um, all the gold accounts um, will have the, 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 the numbers 777 in, inside the accounts. We have uh, another situation which is arising and because of the influence that Jews in, in, in business, and I, I don't mean that derogatively at all, 
Um, I, I often say thank God for the Jews, but because our global financial system to a large extent actually comes from them. And you can even trace that back further. You can, you can actually go through and trace that back into the period of Akhenaten in, in Egypt, back even beyond that, probably to the Minoans. Right? Um, so these, these systems have been around for a very, very long period of time. But what's interesting in this, if you go back to the Jewish times from in the early, they had a thing called the Shemitah. The Shemitah is a, a, a year of forgiveness when, when debts are cancelled and, and, uh, and we have a, a, a totally new beginning. We have also the blood moons. Now, I'm not one normally led too much into, into things I don't understand. And I, and I don't understand all, all the things like the blood moon. I do understand that these are supposedly an under in Jewish religion and, and uh, even in Christianity, these are understood to be warnings from God. And I do believe in God. Um, and that there is a history of extremely interesting things happening in every in seven year cycles. So I think you're going to go into a period where you're going to have several years before you actually come out of that. I think it'll, it'll really begin maybe, maybe next year will be the real crunch. I think there'll be reverberations that will start this September, but I don't think they're going to totally collapse. Now, here's what I do find interesting. Is the US dollar going to collapse? I would think probably not. And I'll tell you why. I think the US economy is going to collapse, but not necessarily the dollar because the US dollar is not a US dollar. It's not a United States dollar. And I'm quoting from that, um, Russell Monk, from, who's the Assistant uh, General Counsel of the U.S. Treasury, and he's quite right when he says that uh, a U.S. dollar is not a United States dollar, because it's not. It's, it's, it's a global currency. And so the U.S. dollar is actually used worldwide in all countries. Not all countries are going to feel this strain at the same time. I think, I think it's probably going to start in America. Certainly, biblical prophecy seem to, to promote that belief. And certainly, there are uh, anybody that, that looks at the, the figures from a commercial banking side as analysts on the commercial bank. And I'm not one of those. I look at it just from a pragmatic side, of, of the, from the global account side. So I see it a little bit differently. But I think... Um, there will be a great impact on the US dollar by perception, right? What people perceive because the, the value and the strength of the US dollar is determined by people's understanding of what the US dollar actually is. Um, it, it says it very, very well in, in three words. In God, we trust. Well, it's actually four words, isn't it? but in God we trust. Um, in other words, they're saying there's nothing behind the US dollar. And because of the way the, the US government has allowed the banks to override the law, and, and not only have they allowed them to override it, they've facilitated it. And, for, and, and because they've facilitated um, means for banks to circumvent what were originally very sound, practical banking systems that, we, we, that we're standing on the edge of the abyss. 
Now, the, 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 the problem is how deep is the fall? And that is going to depend on one thing, perception. It's what people perceive it, it, it is. If they perceive it as a total absolute disaster on a worldwide scale, then the US dollar is probably doomed because nobody will have any faith in it. And it's the faith in the, in, in, in the value of a currency is what makes a currency actually work. But to have faith, firstly, I think you also need to have understanding. And you need to understand exactly what the US dollar is. And as I said, it is not a US-based currency. It's the currency that the United States uses. It's a global currency. If you ask me, would I prefer to have my money in US dollars or euro? I'll take US dollars every time. And, and, and there's a reason for that. And the reason I, I say that is because the US dollar is underpinned by the global accounts. And that's, that's a, a very significant reason to, to maintain that position. However, the value is determined by the market and the market is driven by perception. So there's a pretty good chance then if the perception is positive that the disaster won't be quite as bad in the U.S. Exactly. I, I Personally, I don't see any reason for the pessimism other than internally within the United States there are issues that are occurring. We, we all know about Jade Helm and everything else. Um, but exactly what these things mean, I, I don't really know. I... I and so when you're trying to predict something ahead, you need to know all the various aspects. So what, tell me what role uh, you see China playing in all of this in the United States and the global uh, financial situation. China is setting up uh, a parallel system, basically to the IMF, to the BIS, and, globe, and China is in a much better position to do that. Mm -hmm. Where that's going to end, again, there are too many political aspects to it. For example, in China, in just one place, there's 254,000 tonnes of gold. In another place that I know of, there's 67,000 tonnes of gold. In another place that I know of, there's 36,000 tonnes of gold. So this gold is not actually owned by China, by the way. But if China turned around and said, well, okay, you guys want to go that way. We've decided we don't like that way. We're going this way. What does the world do at that particular point? If it has two opposing and two totally different financial systems, the world is going to leave one and it's going to move and gravitate to the other, or it's going to walk away from what is being proposed and, and consolidate in the, in, in the original one. The original one has become such a mess that very few countries really want to rely on that. And, and it may well be today, and this is, this is what I see as one of the greatest tragedies. I have always respected America for one thing. It's the stability that it brought into the world. But that stability, when it's lost in the United States, what happens to the rest of the world? That's gone. And so you're now left with two other major powers. One is Russia, one is China. Both of them are relatively totalitarian states. Is that a bad thing? Not totally. I've lived in China and I've found China great place to be um, but I would still prefer to have democracies Russia is supposedly a democracy today but it has leanings towards a, a more totalitarian side and maybe that is what the world needs to anchor it maybe that is what we need 
the problem with organisations like the United Nations is they can't get out of their own way because you have this side wants this and that side wants that. And so where do you finish up? You finish up nowhere. And, and, and so that in itself is a, a, a problem. When you look at these things economically, these shifts and these dynamics that are playing in, coming into place, they're driving down growth or the, 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 the ability of growth we're rapidly destroying entire civilizations, and that's tragic. We're destroying what has been traditionally a base, and are we going to end up with one global totalitarian organization or another? That's we could debate that you know for six months and still not come up with an answer. So. Again, you look at it from an economic perspective. I don't think things are going to be as bad as people think they're going to be. I also think they're going to be disastrous. Make no mistake about that, but they're not going to be. I don't think they're going to go in the direction that people think they're going to be. And I think the sooner we can get an alternative financial and economic system up and going, the faster we're going to be able to heal the problems. There has to be, if, if you're going to have a problem, somebody's come, we've got to come along with a solution. And if there's a solution, if we can find a solution, then um, the situation may not be as bad as what, what we would, uh, would, you know, a lot of people would see. But just how that's going to play out, it's, it's, it's just too hard to say because there's too many aspects of it. So based on what you see now, you're anticipating, you would expect some kind of system to be in place, what, by middle, middle of next decade maybe? or is that middle of next decade, I would think probably by about, it, it, it'll be solid, it'll, it'll start probably when this starts, when, when the problem starts. Which is the actual month. yeah the actual mechanisms won't be recognised until probably you get into the middle because people there's going to be too much turmoil in the world so wherever this starts and and, and I have a very good idea where it will start um, but where it starts is going to be not enough to convince the rest of the world that this is the right model. But once it's been going for a few years, other, other, other countries will then look at that and say, this is what we should be doing. And so, and, and then when it, when it catches on, it'll, it'll grow, I would think, quite exponentially. But you've got to get away, we've got to get away from usury and we've got to get a, a system that consolidates the actual wealth of nations. You can't do it otherwise. And you've got to have a system that creates and generates wealth rather than a system that debilitates. And that's what we have today. And we have that because the government's allowed this, by the way. The, 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 the changes, the original plan, which was set up at the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, was relatively good. It had, it had some failings. And, it, and uh, it didn't allow for the expansion of global trade the way that global trade did expand through the, through the 1960s. But, uh, and, and, but they amended that, but they also changed a lot of the rules that allowed banks to, to actually become masters of the world, if you like. And banks are more powerful today than governments. And, and that should not be. That should not be. The will of the people should be the most powerful thing on this earth. And we have to bring it back to that. But we also have to bring, I think, uh, an economic system where that can be applied and where there is freedom among people, not, not usage. Um, people are not, they're not animals. They're not there to be used. They're, they're part of a world, part of, something better, but it's a struggle getting there. But I think it'll start probably 19, we, we'll, this, this process will start probably, my feeling is in 1916, 
uh, sorry, 2016. And it will continue up to about probably 2024, 2025, for the time it gets off and away. Mm-hmm. And, and so in that system, what, what actually changes? Do we no longer have a bond issued or is that all that, all that is still going to be in place, do you think? Well, it's bonds, just... bonds, are, the bonds are a necessary part of, of, uh, of um, the financial or economic structures. But I don't, I don't see that being a particular problem. I see the problem being... Um, in how, in a bond, these are these would become tradable assets, and there would have to be income that would be derived from those bonds. But in general, debts like national debts and things like that should not not occur. And when people go and 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 you deposit an asset, if you don't deposit an asset, then of course you have to borrow money. But if you're depositing an actual asset into the treasury and, and uh, then you're also making payments against that asset, uh, there is no debt. So why are you paying interest? So essentially, let's just use a real world example just to simplify this. So basically, you want to buy a house and the house is the asset and that house is actually being deposited into the treasury but, and yet the bank is charging you interest uh, to pay for that house when you've already deposited the asset. That's basically what you're saying, right? Yes, correct. Why, why are you paying interest? If, if, if the asset is deposited in the National Treasury, the National Treasury has no need to collect interest from you. A repayment, yes, because it's drawn the money from the global accounts, which is held in your name, and it's drawn that money. You're the beneficiary of that. You can use that. It's there to underwrite your loans. That's, that's the entire purpose of it. But what you can then do is you, you will repay that money, but you don't need to pay any interest on it. For what? Now the National Treasury has got, uh, you, you've created an asset. The Treasury has the value of the asset, right, in, in substance, not just in, not in just uh, uh, notional terms, but in, in, in actual real substance the same as if it were a gold bar or something else. And now you've got a proper collation and a proper um, uh, structure to national, to national wealth. And if so, you put that together, then, then you, can issue, you can issue whatever currency you like against that wealth, and the currency will always be strong. Mm-hmm. It, it can't go any other way. So if I buy a $250,000 house, then that $250,000 the house basically is the asset that the treasury holds and the $250,000 comes out of the value of the bond that was issued at the time I was born. Correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And they, pay, they actually, if the bank gave me a check, because when you go into the bank, you issue a treasury note, right? The bank gives you, sorry, you issue a, a, um, uh, a promissory note. Now, if you go to the, the generally accepted accounting principle rules, a promissory note is cash, and the bank is to treat it like cash. So what the bank should do is the bank should deposit that into your account as a liability of the bank, as, because you've come along, you've deposited that money in your account. What the bank does, it, it doesn't do that anymore. What they do is they move that across and, and, and enter it as an asset of the bank, but it's not. And then they lend you, they give you a bank check against that asset. So technically what they should do is they should register that. If you go to UCC 3, I think it's 305, um, uh, 3503 or 3305, one or the other. But you, you go to issue the promissory note, you give the bank the promissory note. The bank issues, deposits that in your account as your money because that's what it is, because it draws that money down from the treasury. Then what happens is the bank will issue you a bank check so that you can go and pay Mr. Bloggs for the house you just bought from him. But you've already paid the bank. It's completely prepaid. Now the bank, the bank then lies to you and it says, we loaned you the money. The bank didn't lend you any money at all. What the bank did was 
it took your promissory note, entered it in as their asset, and against that gave you a bank check. It's not the correct procedure, and so it doesn't get actually picked up by the auditors. That's where the problem is. And what they're actually doing is they're cheating the Treasury out of the, the money that should be being repaid back to the Treasury. So at the end of the day, they're cheating you and they're cheating me. This, this, this is something that has to be stopped. So, uh, yeah, look, I look at these things. Uh, what then happens is your, the bank takes your property then and says, well, this is ours until you pay for it. Now, the bank puts that on as an asset of the bank. Then it comes and sits down. Now, by the way, you've got to pay that money to us, so they repay the money, uh, but by the way, with interest. The bank's already got all the value behind the money that it's loaned you. The bank has already been paid also by the treasury. The, the, the bank, okay, let them, they'll, they will repay the treasury over a period of time. But what they will then do is they will pay the, um, they, they will sell the, the title thing to under a collateral mortgage offering. And so it's just theft. Doesn't matter how you look at it. It's just what they do. So when you go over to an interest-free system, do we no longer have banks or the banks have to change how they're actually? Why don't we, why don't we, for example, if you go in most countries, the post office is actually a department of the treasury. So why don't we, why don't we make our loan applications at the post office have them processed through the treasury, have the title sent directly to the treasury and have everything sent directly to the treasury and then we just repay the treasury. Why don't we do it that way? Why do we need the banks? Seems like quite a long, uh, quite a big step to go towards something like that to where we no longer have banks. Do you really think that's possible in, in 10 years time? It's possible. It's unlikely because you'll still need financial uh, systems, for example, for running, operating things like credit cards and operating things like, uh, you know, debit cards and uh, operating electronic banking. Uh, I think those things uh, are best done by banks. And then in fact, even the mortgage system is best done by banks if the banks do it honestly. Now, you've got a system you're planning through the company that you're working with to, to create something like that in Australia, correct? We, 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 no, probably not in Australia first. Mm. Australia's too big uh, and it's too complex. It's too complex. Um, there's a simpler way to do this and that's to, to start somewhere in, in, in a smaller area in, in, in a country that, uh, and you also have to get past, you also have to get people to understand. You must realise that when you elect a member of parliament or you elect a member to Congress or you elect a member to, to, uh, to government, they don't understand any of these systems. And they can be there for 30, 40 years and they don't understand any of these systems, but they are the ones who determine whether that is the system. The reason we have the problem is because they don't understand the system. So they, who do they go to talk to? They talk to bankers. And what do bankers do? They follow their vested interest. And it won't change. We, we, need to, we, we do need to actually change that. And it's, it's exactly the same in a country like Australia. It's just too complex and, and too heavy. You need to start somewhere in, in, a, in a small thing, prove the system, show how it works, and then, then as governments become to understand it, the simplicity of it and the effectiveness of it, then, then that, that could go worldwide. But whatever happens, and it's not a system that we need to start. As I said, this is not something new. This is not new. Uh, they did this in the, in the, in the, in, uh, in the United States, uh, pre-revolutionary, the, the, before the Revolutionary War. Right? The, 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 the states operated with a, a colonial script. And so, and that worked really well. And the US was extremely prosperous right up until the time where they got rid of that uh, because of the, the, the pressure from the banks of, in, in England. So, the, those are the sort of issues that you, you, you've got to deal with. But 
while the world's in turmoil, it's probably a good time to start that because the world, if when it's too organised, it's very difficult to start something new. Mm-hmm. So, do you anticipate the end of the uh, the need for the Internal Revenue Service in the United States and other taxing agencies such as that when this transition happens? I don't. There, there really is no need for them to exist. If the if the Treasury is the arbiter and, and controller of wealth, there is no need for many of these things. I think there's probably uh, is there a need for a government revenue service? Probably, but certainly not in the way that it operates today uh, as as um, uh, as the Internal Revenue Service, certainly not. I don't think I don't think that's a good thing, and I don't think income tax in itself is actually a good thing. I think a limited income tax. I saw the proposal that Donald Trump made the other day, which is, in my view, is absolutely excellent, and I think it would uh, it would have people quite willingly and quite happily paying their paying paying some level of of income tax. Um, and what he proposed, uh, I thought was outstanding. It, 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 it would really work, and it would benefit the the community, and it would create growth, and it would create certainly a tremendous strength in the economy. So, how, how do individuals in the United States or any part of the world really prepare for the years ahead that you think could potentially be a bit tumultuous, but really depending on how we perceive uh, all that's coming as well. Uh, how do those of us who understand this information and who are in a position to be more knowledgeable about it prepare to transition that with, uh, in the most empowering way? That is the hardest thing because at the end of the day, what can a single person do? Well, you had a single person in Christopher Columbus who changed the world. And, and quite often single people do. Have, having the knowledge and the understanding of what needs to be done is not necessarily gives you the capacity to do it. And so over a period of time, you need um, collusion, if you like, for a better word, with people who are in a position to implement certain things. So you need governments that are ready to and willing to take along the, the, the system. Do we have something like Bitcoin? Bitcoin, no, because Bitcoin is, is backed by what? An algorithm. That's not something to have too much faith in. But if you have faith in value, if, if money is completely backed by value, and you can have faith in that, then I would think that would be an ideal uh, system because everybody would know exactly what the wealth of a particular country is, what its capacity is, what its what its earning capabilities are, what its you know, and what it can issue in the in in, in currencies. And in currency, uh, people only need to believe that the piece of paper that they hold represents value. And if, if, if a government has value way beyond the value of the amount of paper that it issues, then people can believe in that. It it's becomes a, a fairly simple uh, exercise because the actual value is there and, and that piece of paper represents your title of part of that value. And so you, you can transfer that. But do we need to have interest attached to that? No. Well, what? Well, people can say to pay the banking system. Well, well, if you've got a banking system that needs that, then and and rather than a banking system that's earning from growth and wealth and development, um, once a bank is earning from that, and, and banks can in, in, in enormous ways, then I think... Um, we're, 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 we would be on a much better track. But if you're going to go into the constant debt cycle, we're always going to be overtaken eventually by the compounding of the debt rather than the growth of the, the wealth. And that, that then becomes a problem. So what sort of, um, so in the next month, which month of September, we're in August right now, 
Um, so by the time the show comes out, it'll be pretty close. What kind of things should we be looking for as signs that, um, that things are moving along uh, in the direction that you uh, have spoken about today? What, what would we expect to see? I think the first thing is going to be the actual turmoil that you're going to, to have. But in terms of going into a new, totally new system, that'll, that'll start ignominiously. It'll, it'll start in a way that's almost not, not even noticeable or even discernible because it's like anything else. One of the problems in, in the world of today is that there are two kinds of people, people who want to change things and people who want to keep them the way they are. And unfortunately, the people who want to keep things the way they are are in the majority, always will be. And the people who want to change things are usually very few and they don't get much support. And the reason they don't get much support is because nobody really knows how well it will work until it, somebody makes it work, until, an, until it is actually working. In the meantime, the naysayers, they will do everything they can to destroy that. That's normal. That, I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's been the, 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 the path of progress for, for 2,000 years. It's not going to change. To, to see a start, if you, I, I would say to anybody, um, if a new system, to get a new system going, it will be probably start where it's not seen right? and, and where it's not actually discerned by people. It will start somewhere that's quite different, uh, not, in, not in the major financial centres at all. It will start away from there. Um, but I also think that it will take time because it, it will take probably four or five years for there to be sufficient assets within that system to, so that it actually can stand on its own. And, and it will take that time. So maybe then in the, the three or four years after that, then the, the rest of the world will probably head that way. But you're already looking at, at seeing the, the, the problems. You've got the problems in the United States. They're not going to change. I, I don't dispute what we're hearing in financial news. I don't dispute um, the, what people are saying. My experience is not with commercial banking. It's with what's in behind commercial banking, what underpins it, what structures are. And, but in, in that process, I also see what's wrong and what's not happening that should be happening and what should be happening that's not happening. And so you look at those and those are the primary indicators of, of, what, uh, of where we're heading as far as I'm concerned. But that's, that's from a personal perspective. From an ordinary working person, God, I'd hate to be in that position today. I really, really would. Um, very, very difficult for, for people to, to get a hold. They don't even understand the actual facts and, and, and truth about banking. So how can they, how can they defend themselves in, in these things? They can't. They so can't. Even knowing what we know from this conversation today, um, what can you do? Is there anything you can do to to um, function within the existing system and, and in a more self-empowering yeah. way. Sure, sure. Look, even when you introduce a new system, the new system is just a, begins as a part of the old system. It just becomes a better way of doing things. Um, and, and legally, the systems are already there within the laws of, of countries to do it this way. Um, it's just a matter of getting the understanding and the perception and the right people um, on board, then, then these things can happen. But they're not going to happen just with the ordinary common man in, in the early stages. It's going to be an actual government that's going to have to pick this up and run with it. Um, and then when, when their system comes around and it's working perfectly and working very, very well, then other governments will take notice. Governments are by nature very conservative creatures because nobody wants to be uh, to take the bold steps and be out of step with everybody else because you know that's 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 um, 
it's like trying to you know face a crocodile with that's that's about to take your head off um no it, it, it i i don't know how to explain that to you in terms of what you would actually see i think you will see a country that will have a different system and that that system is working extremely well and so other countries will then pick it up and i think that's that's what the changes will be it's not and it's not going to happen overnight and i think the world will be in just too much turmoil over the next um, seven or eight years to to uh, probably take a lot of notice mm -hmm. Do you, do you think that from your experience in working with the OITC and the different kind of individuals you've probably run across, do you believe that there is this um, organization that people refer to as the Illuminati, uh, people oh, who absolutely. are in these? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Let, let, let me explain how that all comes about because <laughs> that's about as real as it gets. Um, yes, definitely the thing. And that's, that's the thing that has to be guarded against. You can see that actually operating in America today. Now, let me, let me explain something to you. Do you. Are you aware the Queen of England is actually a thief of the Vatican? You're aware of that, right? And for anyone that's not, 1137, King John signed England over to the Vatican. Right? And the city of London is the, actually still a remnant of that. It's a one square kilometre zone within London itself, which is a completely different, it's not even part of England. It's, a, it's a, an independent area within, in, in, within England. And all law in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, it all emanates from the city of London. Everything emanates from there. And that, in turn, is controlled by the Vatican. If you go back here to the original uh, Knights Templar, which was founded around 1215, the Knights Templar uh, lasted for around 150 years. And for over 100 years, they were the world's bankers. They the, they're, they're the first, apart from Jews, they're the, the, the major banking system that the world ever saw. And there was a time through that 150 years where the, the Knights Templar were accumulating gold at the rate of approximately one tonne a day. And that went on for 100 years. And they had this massive wealth. When the Knights Templar was, were outlawed, they disbanded and they hid all their wealth. Uh, a lot of it was actually hidden in Languedoc in, in France and it was later transported to places like the Philippines and to Asia and into a lot of the old royal Asian households, some of it's in China, um, and a lot of this wealth actually belongs to them. Now, behind all this, there is this organisation which is the emanates from the, um, uh, the lodges of, of uh, what do we call them, the... Um, Freemasons. Freemasons. Because what happened is when the the... Knights Templar were disbanded. Most of them actually joined Freemason lodges, and in actual fact, they really took control of the Freema of the of Freemasonry because they had the wealth. They had this massive amount of wealth, and it was used through the systems. and the And, and the Knights Templar have never died. They're, they're still in existence. They they still exist today. And we can call them the Illuminati. We can call them whatever they like. Not necessarily the Knights Templar. The Knights Templars are uh, very much against what a lot of things that are happening, but the Freemasonry Lodges. Um, and they've formed this Illuminati, and, and it is a very real thing. It's very secretive. It, it, it is a real threat to the world. There's absolutely no question about that. And it's, it's exactly the same, uh, birth certificates and everything. These things are all controlled through the BIS, through the IMF, through central banking system and these things are controlled by the Illuminati. Right? Even the symbols, you'll see that in the symbols of the Federal Reserve. These are all Illuminati symbols. These are all go back again to the symbols of the, of the Knights Templar. So, uh, and, and that wealth is still 
held in the system today, the wealth of the Templars, still in existence. It's, it's held today by one particular person, uh, as, as listed as the actual owner, but it, it was drawn down. Uh, we keep hearing about the Philippines, but the Philippines actually got most of this wealth coming through through Banco Espanol, uh, the Filipinas. And that was that uh, banking system. Uh, the Spanish transferred all their gold through the Scottish Rite Freemasons. They transferred that and, and also through the Vatican with, with the help of the Vatican was brought to the Philippines uh, way back in the, uh, in the in the Spanish era during the Napoleonic Wars. And so that wealth is actually held there, but it's, it's, it's part of the centralised system, all of it is. Even the stuff that so-called Japanese took. Um, the, the person who was in control of that wasn't uh, General uh, Yamashita, the person in control of that was uh, another general by the name of Shigenori Kuroda. Now, I knew uh, Shigenori Kuroda. I worked with him for about four and a half years before he passed away. He supposedly died in 1954. That's not true. He, he survived the war. He went back and he lived in the Philippines under the name of Julio Valenzuela. And uh, it's quite a long story, too long to talk, tell here as to how I come to understand his identity and who he actually was. And it was him that actually took me to a lot of the places that a lot of this gold was was uh, held. A lot of this gold has actually been recovered and it's been re-centralised. Um, it's all certificated. It's all held in the banking system. It's all used every day of the every day of the the year. Uh, this wealth is used, and it's used to actually underpin the global wealth as we know it today, the United States dollar. So you've physically seen a lot of this gold earlier earlier in your years. Unfortunately, yes. And I say unfortunately. Um, there's been things in, in that, that, that you see and you know, and you sometimes maybe in recollection, maybe better we didn't know. But uh, yes, unfortunately. And it is, it is well secreted and it's well secured. Uh, most of it is actually where people have no idea. There is some of it that has been open. Um, there is some in, in Thailand where it's uh, the, the military have got control of it and they're doing whatever they do. But uh, it's very difficult to actually use any of this gold because it's all marked. I, I mean, when it's mar I say it's marked, it has internal markings. You can smelt it, you can refine it, you can do what you like, but you won't remove that. Um, you'll remove the greater part of it, but the minor parts of it, you won't totally remove, and it'll always be identifiable as to where it came from and who it belongs to. And and, and, and it's all owned. It's not not something that somebody came along and they brought, you know, 240 tonnes of gold and they buried it there in the ground and it's all forgotten about. No. Those are all actually registered repositories. And people have no right interfering with them, uh, none whatsoever. So, so they're marked. They're marked in what? Some sort of molecular level. They're marked. Yes. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And the moment they go into a refinery, it'll be discovered. That's why the reporting system. All refineries have this reporting system. So if any of this gold turns up, they know immediately exactly what it is. And um, and then it, there's a system that it's reported through. Um, countries also have another system, so somebody comes in and sells you some of this gold, the country will allow you to lift it, they'll give you the license and everything to list it and then they report it. Wherever the plane goes and it's carrying the gold, and wherever it lands, uh, you will be met there by people who will say, sorry, but that's not yours. And, and it will be confiscated, it will be taken away, so buying it is a pretty stupid thing to do because you will lose your money. Uh, you, you won't be prosecuted or anything, but you will lose your money. And and it's in, set up intentionally that way to stop people wanting to do things that they shouldn't know they shouldn't be doing. And it also makes banks very cautious and very careful because uh, they also know that these rules exist and that, that uh, you know, you go buying something you shouldn't be buying, somebody's going to come in and, and take it off you. And you lose your money because, and, and, and rightly so, because 
you didn't do either the proper due diligence or you didn't take proper cognizance of what you were taking really was. And, and, and if you're in that business, you should have known better. So, you know, do I have any sympathy for those people? No, none. Um, they do it out of greed. They do it out of uh, a sense of a lot of things. There are some people who do it out of uh, adventure, if you like. Um, but all those things come undone because what happens when you get the lifting um, authority, that's recorded through the system. So the system know exactly what you're going to do with it, where you're going to go. They know everything. And so wherever you turn up with it, they'll be there to meet you. But that's why it's quite safe and people can do what they like, but trying to move this stuff, very difficult. Very difficult. There is a way, there is one way that small amounts can be used. The system doesn't worry about it. It's too small to be bothered with. It would cost more to to implement procedures to prevent that than what it would, you know, the, 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 what the actual losses are. And uh, there are certain people who guard these things and they're entitled to make some money from it. Um, and the system doesn't actually pay them. So they kind of see that as a way that they can have that reward. So is this gold primarily mined somewhere uh, or is this manufactured? No, this is all, this is mostly in bars. I know, but where did, where did it come? Yeah, there is. There, there are large amounts of it in storage in, in, in uh, Argentina, but uh, uh, that's Dore. But uh, the, the barred gold is all stored in various warehouses, bunkers. It's, it, it's hidden away. And the reason is you can't have, for example, a gold standard. How can you have that operating alongside a fiat currency? Because what will happen, the money will just gravitate to to where the gold is that's that the two systems are incompatible with each other and so they, they because they can't work together the, the gold had to be secreted and it has been but it uh, it actually underwrites all money and everybody has equitable access access to it and that was the system that was was actually set up it was a good thing good thing it was intended to stop wars and and, and to stop other problems and it was also intended so that people wouldn't be able to actually acquire sufficient gold to be able to manipulate uh, financial markets with it. And those, those things are, yes, they're good. But, uh, and should it be brought out of that system and recirculated? Absolutely not. Uh, I think the price that's been paid to put it into that system is too great um, for it to be brought out, for it to be, uncontrolled I think the the the, um, the risks that would go with that would be just far too great so it should not and I, I look, I'm not against fiat currencies I'm not against uh, fiat currencies are actually a very good thing because they allow they allow a, a an economy to contract and expand as it needs to it's very flexible uh, it allows you to actually prepay things uh, and then settle that uh, with the the actual asset, so we can. And and and, and as long as the the fiat is always backed by actual value, then the, there's no problem. There is no problem. And um, if we can get our economies to work that way without having the usury problem, then I think uh, we're headed in the right direction. So it sounds like overall we've got some years of difficulty ahead, but but at the end of a certain period of time, maybe middle of next decade, we should start heading into a more positive financial think, future. Yeah, I think after the these troubles, and, and they are going to last, I, I, I think they'll last for several years, but I think at the end of that we're heading into a more enlightened time. We're heading into... Uh, uh, a world that is going to be very different to the world as we see it today. I think we'll be taking more care of the ecology. We'll be taking more care of uh, people. We'll be become probably a more humane society. We'll also become probably a smarter society. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, problems do is they, they actually do make you smarter. 
and and I think uh, yeah. Look, I'm very hopeful about the world in the future. I just foresee this period, which is is going to be very unpleasant, mm. very very unpleasant. The future is is always a wonderful thing, but at the end of the day, it's what people make it. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me today and for sharing your expertise and wisdom in the financial world. And, uh, and we'll, I'm sure I'll be speaking with you again sometime in the near future. I'll look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ethan. I hope you enjoyed the show today with Keith Scott or the Office of International Treasury Control. Join me next week for another incredible show with those individuals who are standing on the leading edge and changing the world.